Okay, I seem to be online. Hello, everybody. You are muted. <laughs> That's How are you? Okay, I'm okay. still adjusting. So, first, first time we meet face to face. Hello. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So, you know, I can hold a couple more minutes and then Okay, for anybody here, um, please sign in and sign up. And then, yeah, I'd like to introduce Peter Allen, who was able to get on I'm personally really curious to see how you got that done and uh, um, see if you can um, talk over that and then the Okay, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, Chris, you will give me a signal again to start. Yeah, go ahead um, if you're good. Go ahead. Uh, okay, good. So give me one minute for technology fiddling. Mm -hmm. And. Right, we should be there. So, sharing, sharing, sharing. Every two of us at somewhere else. Uh, sharing. Okay, got it. Screen one. And that looks good. Hooray! Okay. So, <clears throat> we can lift off. So, uh, first of all, yeah, hello everybody and thank you for having me here actually 
I enjoy the opportunity of uh, talking uh, with queer language aficionados. Uh, not everybody likes the concept as much as I do. And so uh, I'm also very happy to hear uh, your comments later on. So I'm looking forward uh, to some lively discussion as well. Actually, we all know SQL and languages for tables or similar stuff, uh, but array languages are not so common. And I mean, that is the reason why Chris was kind enough to invite me to talk about array query languages. So let's jump into that. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I'm uh, working at something that used to be called Jacobs University, now it's Constructor University. Yes, we renamed ourselves. Uh, 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 let's not discuss the name here. Uh, I'm uh, leading the large scale scientific information systems research group, meaning we are database guys. However, not focusing as many do on business data which personally I find more boring than data from science and engineering. And if you do that, then inevitably you run at some time into multidimensional arrays. We use them in programming, but they also appear in many, many domains. And this is what we have specialized on, working on big data, so large arrays, multidimensional arrays. Here's a link to our research group if you want to follow that. The concepts that we have established at some time way back, uh, we have brought into a system uh, that goes by the name of Rusterman and which then has established this domain of array database systems. That again has let us stumble into standardization. And so I'm doing what's uh, often called data cube standards today as well. And as people got interested in the system that we have built, at some time, a spin-off company was established, going by the na same name as the tool, and giving commercial support. And since then, we are flying in close formation and uh, also working together. Yeah. So let's look around. If we look into data, and in particular big data, we find a lot of variety at first glance. And I have done a really, really random selection here. Uh, but if you look at it from a computer science perspective at some time, you find out that, hey, uh, this is actually not so many different structures that we find, which is not so much of a surprise, actually, because in programming languages, we have a set of structures and we work with them in all uh, domains. So what I actually uh, like to uh, bring up is uh, the thesis that we have a few well-defined basic data structuring principles and they need to be supported. Sets historically are first with tables and uh, so we have independent units, the tuples, that can be connected only through some magic with foreign keys, etc. At some time uh, with product data management actually in the 1980s, hierarchies came up. And so we had suddenly database support for strict hierarchies. What has remained and what we still know is XML databases. And more recently with JSON structures. Okay, giving up the hierarchies, we end up with graphs, a very exciting research field. And ISO has just delivered a graph query language, GQL. So that is something that is also finding its way into uh, our orchestration of data. Well, and then you have arrays uh, which stand out because you do not follow a path uh, to the record. And you do not uh, have a um, random uh, position in a hierarchy that you follow, but you compute the address. And if you do that in multiple dimensions, then you end up with something that is called rasters or grids or arrays in programming language. So this is actually what I feel that database systems should support. Okay, now in application domains, if we uh, move away from the pure technology, actually you find that there's really a lot of application fields. And uh, I believe that you can summarize that into sensor data, image data, simulation data, and statistics data. Simulation, like for example, weather forecasts. And so you find a large application domain where support for such data is needed, data that are too large to fit into main memory. 
and that leads me to the array analytics understanding. We want to do efficient analysis on multidimensional arrays and not on small ones, that is boring, but on those ones which are orders of magnitude above the evaluation engine's main memory. And as we talk about a server, this is big main memory. So uh, what's interesting is if these don't fit into the large service that we have. Okay, what's actually essential here? Uh, what is special? Well, the essential data property is this Euclidean neighborhood, or in plain words, the red point has one neighbor and exactly one neighbor in every direction. So up and down, one neighbor. Left and right, one neighbor. Back and front, one neighbor. Of course, except at the border of the array, at the border of the cube, where suddenly you don't have a neighbor any longer. But the human nodes have this well-defined neighborhood uh, property. And then we can define secondary criteria, the number of dimensions, and uh, the density, so do we have sparse or dense data? Uh, that is actually a minor thing then. Okay, from a database perspective, we talk about the data model, and then inevitably, we talk about the operation model. In essence, uh, the operations is linear algebra, or more specifically tensor algebra, because what we see here effectively defines multidimensional tensors. Uh, the plus plus means that we have to add a few more things uh, that we need in practical life, but essentially is tensor algebra. Okay, that allows us then uh, to build um, servers. Why actually do we want that? I hear people say, no, a server must be very simple so that it can have high performance. No. Here is a counter example. Um, the vegetation index is one of the things that remote sensing people frequently want to do. Uh, we have a demo online, which can dry out yourself anytime, where actually you see a race. On the left hand side, we take a false color image, so infrared, red, and green channels. And the server does the simplest thing possible, it just delivers the file from this to you. Okay, on the right hand side, we have previously inserted this same image into the database and we execute the query that you see here which perform, uh, performs some pixel-wise operations. Now according to common theory that should be slower because hey there's processing involved. And actually as we see hey wait a moment so this is about five uh, six times faster. How come? Well the processing is so fast in the server you don't notice it but you notice something else. Let's look at this in detail. On the left-hand side, you transport for every pixel three values, red, green, blue, three times eight bit. On the right-hand side, you transport one bit. And if you look at this image, you see that this compresses nicely. So uh, effectively, you have a much smaller data transport, and that is what you can observe here, which in fact is a typical big data situation here. Yeah? Big data means too big to transport. So don't deliver the raw data, that is bad service quality and it's slow, but make the server intelligent. And that is my point. The server needs to be intelligent enough to understand what we really want, and then it will not be higher service quality, but also faster. Okay, so much about my uh, personal intentions. And then early on, people said, um, we want to match this into relations. Can't we do that relationally? Well, the problem is an array is actually not a data type, I was lying, but it's a type constructor, something like a stack. You don't have a stack as a data type, but you instantiate that as a stack of integer, a stack of float. In the same way, you instantiate arrays into the arrays over integer, over float, over RGB, etc., and with some particular dimension. Now, this is something that um, you cannot do with object relational extensions because they are not data types, but not type constructors. This may seem academic now and very theory based, but it has very practical consequences with respect to the power of the servers. Actually, if you look at that and we found that out the hard way, uh, it's not only the concepts, but also the implementation of the stack as such. Just to give you one example, relational servers are built to work with small tuples where many tuples fit into one disk page. 
with arrays, we have the inverse situation where one array stretches over many pages and potentially over multiple disk partitions. So, yes, we also need to have some architectural reflection. Okay, and so now we can go and build a query language. And uh, as database people like to do that, let's start with an algebra. Uh, so at some time, we built an algebra, which is minimal, actually. It has only two basic operators. And one key design criterion was we do not want explicit loops. Because loops are bad. Loops have the bad habit that they sometimes don't terminate. And SQL, for good reason, does not have such loops either. Okay, so we want the array iteration process. And then actually, we, want, we do not want to prescribe a particular iteration sequence because, hey, our image may come in tiles. And then we have a totally different iteration sequence. And I, as a user, just don't want to know that. But an important design decision was then actually to embed that into SQL. There are some other approaches which do that differently. Uh, in particular, our design decision was that we see arrays as a new attribute, a new kind of attribute in tables. So you see we have the overall embedding. There are other approaches like MoneyDB and SciDB. They actually say, okay, we can conveniently map an array into a table. And then each array becomes a table. Uh, for several reasons, I find this not optimal. It has some problems, and this is why we went the other direction. And now, with a QL with those two operators, you can do stuff up to, say, discrete Fourier transform. Yes, there are limits, uh, but you can do quite a few useful things in practical life. Good. So, what does that look like? We have some uh, definition, uh, which is just mathematics. I don't want to go through that in detail with you. I just want to say, yes, there is mathematics behind. In the yellow box, you find the query language equivalent to it, where we have an MRA constructor that first defines the iteration, which is implicit. So X goes from 0 to 99, Y goes from 0 to 99. And in the values clause, we have an expression that computes a value for every position. Once again, in what sequence we do that uh, is totally open. Okay, so we can do something as simple as a uh, matrix addition, for example. And once we have that, we find out that oh, this is too complicated. We want to have short hands. And so we come up with short hands for several common cases, brackets for subsetting, and what uh, somebody called induced operations. Uh, we just write an expression and then it's silently applied to the whole array altogether. So that is the constructor. And now the sort of dual part of it is what we call condenser. It's actually an aggregation like in SQL, but we wanted to be able to talk about aggregation and array something. So we call the array something a condenser. And it does exactly the same thing. We provide an operation, the condensed operation, in this case a plus, and then you define an iteration uh, that can span multiple dimensions. Optionally, you have a selection predicate, and in the using clause, you specify the expression that is evaluated at every position like it was before. This allows you to do the usual suspects, and again, to do some convenient shorthand notation, like count, sum, average, and so on. And then you have a convenient way to write how to aggregate data. Once again, iteration sequence is totally undefined here. It's up to the server to define that. Okay, and as it turns out, with those two operations, you can do a lot of things. Uh, in particular, when you combine them, uh, just to show you some examples, in such a query, uh, we can do a matrix multiplication. We use an MRA constructor that defines the result matrix, which is the I and J. Uh, coordinates, and in the values clause, you find the condenser, which resembles the sum operator, uh, where we multiply and iterate over k. So this is a relatively straightforward translation from the mathematical notation into the query syntax. The second example shows the histogram. 
where now we define uh, iteration variable called bucket that iterates from 0 to 255. Assuming 8 bit values, we want to have 256 buckets. And every bucket receives the count of the cells where the pixel is exactly that bucket number. Uh, this equals, by the way, is an induced operation which goes over the full matrix. Okay, and so uh, what's notable here is that we can construct arrays that are totally different from the original arrays, different in the number of dimensions and different in the number of cells that you define here, the cell structures. Okay, so this, uh, let this be enough for giving you a flavor. And now the next step is uh, we embed that into SQL because we said we have a design decision uh, that we have attributes that can be arrays now. Yes, these attributes can become big, but we don't worry about this on a conceptual level. So we assume here that we have a climate simulations table with four dimensional uh, arrays and the data attribute in this table is the uh, array. And then we can do subsetting in the first dimension, give me everything. In the second, a cutout from 100 to 200. Third dimension, everything. And in the fourth dimension, do a cut, a slice, as we call it, at position 42. So the result will be a set of three dimensional arrays extracted from the four dimensional arrays. Then we can look into the pixels and do processing. We have seen that before. Uh, this is simply applied to the arrays overall. You find the principle, by the way, in many languages, array-oriented languages like APL or R or MATLAB, uh, they do a similar thing. Good. And then uh, what we also want to do is we want to go into a search. And uh, with the help of the condensers, actually, we can put criteria into the WHERE clause and we can search for that. For example, we want to find all MRI data where the intensity exceeds some threshold within, within some validity mask. That would be the expression here. Okay, and then we have some down-to-earth stuff like uh, encoding, decoding, and encoding of data, because as opposed to tables, you cannot represent that as ASCII, not conveniently, so we need to support formal conversion. Okay, so that shows the principle of how to embed that. And at some time, the ISO folks uh, got excited about that and said, hey, we want to add that to SQL. And after some work of the team, uh, actually part 15 emerged, which is MBA standing for multi-dimensional arrays. So yes, SQL can do arrays. Good. Um, how does that work? Well, first of all, the DDL is extended. We can define arrays as attributes. So the green one is the standard stuff, and the red one, the scene, would be the picture. Forget about the row constructor that is already in SQL, although it's not so well known. Important is the MD array keyword for multi dimensional array, and in brackets, we denote the extent if we have a fixed extent. Okay. And with that knowledge, now the database system can operate on such arrays and can answer queries. So we can do some band ratio again in the select part, and uh, we can do aggregation and whatever in the where part. And so suddenly arrays are seamlessly integrated into standard tabular world. What's interesting here from a practical perspective is that for the first time now, red and green queries get integrated. Green is metadata, red is data. And suddenly we have a seamless combination and we do not need to decide between different places, different query mechanisms, but it's all one now, which I consider an advantage. Not everybody. There are people who say, no, actually, we want to ship Python code to the server because we are Python programmers and everything should be Python in this universe. And I say, yes, okay, let us think that through. So you set up a server that is very powerful, has lots of data, and you open that, that everybody, really everybody uh, on this planet can send a query to the server unsupervised. Would you sleep well? 
I mean, I can write a denial of service attack in Python in two lines of code. So, for good reason, SQL has been designed in a way that it's called safe in evaluation so that a certain class of attacks you simply cannot formulate. And the OTC WCPS, I will come to that later on, it's another data cube language, is likewise safe in evaluation, which programming languages are not, let alone the hassle of writing big code. Okay, so much about my rant and rave against Python. Uh, just a little bit about architecture. Of course, the big data get split in the server, they get partitioned, and you can do a lot of research and uh, find out how you want to do that. Very often it's just a regular splitting, a regular partitioning. Uh, I had a PhD student, she actually has uh, investigated into tiling strategies, and now we have a storage layout language, which allows us to define on physical level uh, what the tiling is, what compression uh, is to be done, etc. Uh, notably, this is not visible to the user. Like an index in a relational database, you just don't need to know that this exists. You just don't need to know the tiling, which is a difference, for example, to systems like Postgres raster. Okay, uh, but let's not get lost here on that. Uh, one thing that is dear to me. Now that we have a query language, how do we evaluate it? And I said the design decision is to integrate that into SQL. So in the yellow white box, we see the standard query tree, uh, the logical query tree with the relational operators, and we do not touch the set tree. But this remains unchanged. It's just that in the operators that we have, in uh, the where conditions and the select clause, the element tree, so to say, this is where we plug in our stuff and where we plug in the query tree corresponding to the array expression. And with this clear separation, we can deal with those second order attributes and we can optimize. So here is an example for simple query rewriting. If we, for example, want to add two matrices and then determine the maximum, uh, we go into a set of currently more than 150 rules and we find out, hey, actually doing the max of the plus is equivalent to doing the plus of the two maxes. However, the plus now is different. It's not a plus that iterates over every pixel, but it's a single integer operation. So, cool, that is more efficient. So that's what we want to do. And therefore, internally in the query tree, we would replace the left hand side with the right hand side. And hooray, it's more efficient. We can translate that back into the string expression, and then we find two max operators with a plus in between. This way, we do both heuristic op optimization and also cost based optimization. Uh, while I hasten to say, cost based optimization is a wide open field, so we are by far not at the end. Uh, we are still progressing there. Okay, so much about query language, concepts, architecture, just a little bit a kaleidoscope of applications to show you what we have done so far. Uh, human brain imaging. So you have such a brain scan, and after a lot of processing, you get so called act activation maps. You standardize the brains against some canonical brain. And then you can do analytics. In the end, it turns out classical statistics. You can compare to brain maps where we have atlases with brain masks. So you can nicely write that into queries. Okay. Uh, gene expression analysis is another one. Uh, those fancy things here in the pictures are uh, embryos of the fruit fly. And uh, Maria Samsonova in St. Petersburg Polytechnic wants to find out, she researches on the expression, the development. So when does a gene get active and how does the gene uh, change the body? Uh, in the end, what we have is actually three-dimensional for space plus time. So we have four-dimensional somethings. Believe me or not, what you see on the right hand side are manual drawings that they did earlier. Today we are a little bit further, you can obtain any kind of slice, any kind of statistics simply with such an array query. 
Let's get a little bit bigger, cosmological simulation, again for d So the uh, guys doing simulation, they pull together the dark matter and the baryonic matter, and then do a couple simulation on that. And in the end, we get data that look like what you see here when they get visualized. So we have some cutouts for the universe, some galaxy supercluster or so. And once again, this is a case for um, multidimensional analysis with arrays. Uh, obviously, these data are particularly sparse, needless to mention. What else do we have a little bit closer? This is Mars. Uh, so well, this is uh, satellite data, not over Earth, but over Mars that have been put into a service and then over Moon and then over Vesta. I'm talking about Earth. Uh, that is our main application field with geodata, simply because they were the first ones way back who could give us big data. Uh, by the way, big data, I went to SAP and they said, don't worry, we don't need array databases with tiling, we just load everything into RAM. I said, really? I mean, it's big. Yes, we have a machine, we have a server with 128 terabyte. Mm -hmm. I said, and I can tell you archive that has 255 petabyte. Okay, as a result, maybe we do not put everything into RAM. Okay, I mentioned WCPS, that is the second standard that exists. Uh, that stands for Web Coverage Processing Service. Uh, this has more political reasons why it's called like that. Don't try to make sense of it. Um, it's a data cube query language that differs from NDA in two respects. Number one, it is aware of the semantics of space and time. So you do not just have integer coordinates, but you can talk about floating points like lat long, and you can talk about date strings which in turn allows you to model not only regular grids, like the bare arrays, but also irregular grids, which happens quite frequently. And uh, the second difference is that the language flavor here is leaning towards X query. Why that? Because in the geo uh, world, metadata very often are in XML, and so when you search the metadata, you want to use X path and X query, and this way, you can integrate the languages into one. Different flavor, but the mechanics behind is the same. And actually, in our system internally, we translate WCPS queries into NDA queries, which we then execute. Okay, here are some examples of this language. I will skip that because I'm not sure that this is of interest just to show you that, yes, we can do expressions that build, that derive new data cubes based on different criteria. So let me know later if that is of interest to you. Because I would like to stop here. We have around about half an hour. And so what I wanted to bring to your doors is this uh, fancy category of array database systems, which is something relevant uh, because we have many of these big data, really high volume data. And uh, if you look at what we need to support, from a database perspective, we have tensors and linear algebra, tensor algebra on it. And yes, you find uh, some standards. Uh, these query languages are international standards in ISO and in the Open Choose Spatial Consortium. And then I wanted to say that we started actually doing that, documented by the papers, but actually somebody way back has been dealing with arrays already in the past. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. And that was Salvador Dali, as you can see on this picture here. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very curious about discussion now. Thank you. Um, does anybody have questions? Sure. If anyone's thinking, so the one thing, um, the reason I was interested in this work is that uh, we deal in observability with time series data in the form of metrics and telemetry. Uh, and it usually, if you're looking at the Prometheus standard or something, we'll have values coming in at a fairly regular interval that we can then map to an array um, for processing potentially SQL. Um, but one question would be how would you go about? Um, 
analyzing something where the prior, primary means of slicing the data is on a time limit. Right. So, uh, first of all, it's about time. So, we want to have time semantics. Then, I would use the WCPS language, which allows me to express that. And then it's easy uh, to define time intervals. Say, I want to have the average temperature for the past 12 months. You can also do a step in, like sliding windows. Um, for example, I want to have the maximum temperature in January over the last 10 years, and something. And um, you can also talk then about time resolution. We had some interesting question. Time is a really a difficult dimension, uh, but in the end, it's uh, all about defining intervals, and the intervals at some point get mapped internally to the array coordinates where the system can resolve them. And such time series analysis, uh, our users of the system frequently do in uh, um, agriculture, for example, but we have examples also for aviation safety, for radio networks planning, etc. So, and does that still map back down to MDA? Um, Absolutely, yes. Uh, as I said, that is what we do internally. Our WCPS, so the space time semantics, via some extra layer, which results that semantics gets mapped to integer coordinates. And then the underlying engine has no idea that this was space or time. It just operates on the integer coordinates, as always. And on this extra layer, actually, we uh, uh, resolve regular and irregular grids and space-time intervals and interval arithmetics and all of that. Gotcha. Um, then, so you have to have that external service to do the mapping to the embassy. Um, <laughs> uh, does the MDA? Mm -hmm. Um, aspect supports sliding windows on the array data itself, or do you also compute that? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, give me a second. Architecture, architecture. I believe I have a slide for that, yes. So, uh, this is actually the architecture where I see the Rustman server processes at the center. And on top of that, with an extra layer, the geo semantics is resolved meaning it receives WCPS queries and translates that internally into MDA, which is what the lower layer understands. Okay. And um, yes, sliding windows uh, can be done. Um, I don't have a particular one on time here, but where is it? Where is it? Let's go back to this one here. This is not exactly a sliding window, but it shows the principle. You have uh, effectively two loops. You have an outer loop where uh, we iterate over all IJ coordinates, and you have an inner loop that iterates over K. Now, you can use that to define some stepping over the array, and then in the inner loop, you define the window size. For example, I want to have uh, temperature values uh, between 6 in the morning and 6 at night. And then you will slide, you move that uh, via the MRI constructor over the times you want, let us say, over the last 12 months and 365 days. And then, kind of a tangential question, how difficult or easy or what was the process involved and actually working with the SQL standard to, um, to get the MDA. Um, well, you have to be convincing. So I'm really impressed of those people. They are really brilliant guys, and um, they expect you to be brilliant too. <laughs> Otherwise, they are uh, less than interested. Uh, so uh, this is really something where you have to keep up with their pace because in the end what the SQL standard is, it is hundreds, many hundreds of pages of rigorous mathematical static and dynamic semantics definition. So you need to be used to that 
I was used to static and dynamic semantics definition, but I was not used to that syntax. Uh, that is something I had to immerse into, the syntax that they use. And um, so it's not like, uh, don't pass it on, but it's not like OGC, uh, where there's so much of hand waving. Uh, this is really rigorous. Mm -hmm. How long was the process um, from when you started? It was some uh, ramp up phase uh, where I first contacted them and they had to discuss it and finish some business and get into it. I would say it took around about a year until the serious work started. And then it took something like, I guess, two years to come up with some solid specification. And then it has to go through the balloting process, which also took around about a year, I estimate. So definitely expect several years. Mm -hmm. Um, and then with the syntax that you've developed and the features and um, operators and whatnot, is there anything after you've released it out into the wild that you would change or that have been sticking points for end users? So the basic operators are still fine and you can discuss whether you like the syntax or not. Um, that's a different story. Um, we are thinking uh, about how we can make that even more powerful. Uh, so, uh, I said initially that iteration is bad, but sometimes you need iteration. There are many cases where you want iteration. And so, uh, we are looking into how could we define an iteration that gives you that flexibility that you can say, I want to have first coordinate one and then coordinate two and three, so I can enforce a sequence. And uh, still, this is a safe iteration and we have some optimization opportunities. This is something uh, we are currently working on. So uh, it's not so much about changing, it's more about uh, extending, like another onion layer around that. One typical example, uh, which is really a hard example, simple as it is, is matrix inversion. Try to describe matrix inversion analytically. Uh, all the algorithms that I know are iterative, uh, which also means that you get an approximation. So, I don't feel like this field is completely resolved now. There are certainly lots of interesting research questions that are still waiting to be answered. Uh, by the way, if somebody is interested, I would be happy to enter into conversation and uh, maybe to, to keep some loose or tight contact, whatever, and uh, wrap our minds around that. So, may I ask in turn, what are your plans in that direction? Obviously, you have thought about that, you have approached me on that, so uh, obviously you have some plans, right? Uh, well, we're still in exploratory phase, yeah, uh, um, trying to analyze all the different languages out there, all the features that are available. And mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out what the balance between all of the different needs we're facing with users who only want to use a UI to be able to do analysis and click on right. versus the power users who want to be able to create a full script for heavy analysis versus in our domain another unique case kind of to others is that we're working on operational data so often you have uh -huh. engineers who are trying to figure out why is my website down or why is my service down. I need to manipulate this language quickly and easily to find the data. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Actually, that feels like uh, you have to cover uh, the whole spectrum from upstream theoretical design to downstream usability questions. Right. And uh, <laughs> Sounds like some work to do indeed. Uh, may I show you one thing? Because you mentioned uh, people do not necessarily like query languages. 
So what we have done is we have trained the chatbot and now you can get an explanation. We do not say that now you can automatically generate queries. We don't trust that enough, but it's a good productivity tool uh, that helps you to be faster with query design. So that is one of the approaches because yes, we see that uh, query languages, uh, people say that is an extra language I have to learn and not everybody likes that. But what I also see is that people come back uh, to the old idea of visual query languages where you draw boxes and arrows on screen and then a uh, query is generated. Frankly speaking, I'm not so impressed about that. In the end, what you do is on the screen, you draw a, a logical query tree. Okay, but that isn't so much simpler and that isn't so much less work than uh, if you write a query. So I believe if you just learn a little bit of syntax, you can be more productive in the textual way than with those uh, visual query languages, but that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in our domain, it's more about uh, showing different boxes and a uh, very narrow use case where I want to plot this metric. Well, I, yes, if you have restricted capabilities of the uh, server that are easy to grasp with the boxes, then uh, absolutely on board, yes, that can make sense. It's just that when you go into very complex queries, uh, you hit a, a wall where it just gets uh, complicated as well to draw the tree, to draw the query processes. So then one last question before we're a little over time. Um, how do you balance when uh, users are asking uh, for really complex or esoteric features that they would like to add to the language versus saying, um, well, we'll get you this far in the query language, then you need to use a full program like Python to fit. Okay, so uh, the one thing is, uh, then I say, okay, give me a formal definition of the operation that you want, including optimization rules, and then they typically leave uh, the discussion. But seriously, um, what we have added is UDFs, user defined functions. So actually you can add operators to the query language that are implemented outside the server. This is a common feature of relational databases and we have that. And there are sometimes reasons why you don't want to use the query language. One thing is because it's an intrinsically algorithmic question which is hard to transform into such a query. And the second reason can be, okay, I have the algorithm already, I have this program and I don't want to rewrite that. Then we say, okay, put that into a UDF, link it into the server, and then you have it. One prominent example where you don't want to write a query is machine learning, where we actually can add, I don't know where this, uh, this is visible here, uh, you see a WCPS query here. And here is a predict function that receives as uh, input uh, the image subsets. In this case, it's Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 data. And you pass a model as parameter. And in this special case, you can ask a question in natural language. And this is certainly nothing you can or you want to express in a query language. So that is a case for a UDF. Oh, that's impressive. Okay. Um, and then for folks who have uh, other questions for you uh, after observing a video or later on, what would be the best way to reach you? Um, why don't you use email? You can say email contact, and if we find a need for it, we can have another video conference. No problem at all. And as I said, I would be happy uh, to stay abreast of what you are doing out of pure curiosity. And who knows, maybe we find some common interest to do some joint work. Great. Right. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time.
So thank you again for having me and have a nice morning or lunch or evening. Bye-bye now. Right. <laughs> Goodbye, Andrew. Right. Thank you, David.